Good morning. Has it been four weeks already? <laughs> well, time is flying, flying away. <clears throat> well, again, as um, I have um, experienced <clears throat> the part of worship here, um, in my nearly 50 years of um, pastoring and preaching, um, this is very different. I only have to drive 30 minutes to experience a cross-cultural experience, and I've, I keep saying this when I come back often. To me, it's, it's unique. We love to come down here and be a part of this and hear this foreign tongue praising God. Um, we look up there on the wall and how do you begin to make sense out of that? <laughs> and then Henry and some of the others, you, most of you, you know both. That's, that's amazing to us. <clears throat> um, so, uh, just, just the fact, you know, Jesus said back there in the end of Matthew's gospel, and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It started off in Jerusalem, over there, somewhere in the Middle East. I've never been there, but that's where it all started. And um, we're told it's been everywhere. And we know it's been to Korea. <laughs> because here you are uh, in America and are praising the same God that we Pennsylvania Dutch people are praising and worshiping. And that's true of cultures all around the world. God has been faithful and he, has, uh, and he continues to be with us as Jesus said there at the end of Matthew until the end of the age. And I believe we're getting closer to that, which means we're looking forward to that blessed hope that Jesus is returning, he's coming back again. And um, so we see his faithfulness everywhere. And the fact that we're still here is a uh, tribute to that. Well, um, two times ago, um, two months ago, I guess it would be, when I began what I call a little mini series on Questions in Scripture that uh, that demand our answers, and uh, some questions can't be answered. Only God knows the answer. But questions, when we ask them, they it, it does draw out of us, and it causes us to have dialogue and and we talk together. And um, and so questions it's not wrong to ask good questions in the context of faith. When we question God, that's not good. <laughs> but when we ask questions because we want to know more about God, that's a good thing. And uh, two times ago, two months ago, um, I felt like I was asking the most important question that could ever be asked. When Jesus asked his disciples, who are people saying that I am? And you know their response. It was everything but the right thing prophets, you know, and Jeremiah and John the Baptist is back. He had been put to death there in, um, in his uh, dungeon. And some thought he was back again and one of the prophets and so forth. None of them had it right. But who do you say that I am? He asked them. And Peter, the spokesman for the group, came right out as Peter was, could count on him to do. <laughs> And he hit it, the nail right on the head. Is that a term familiar here? When he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's who we represent. That's who we worship. That's who we testify of from week to week and out in our world. The last time I was here, it was Jesus on the cross 
when he asked the question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When his father had actually probably the only time in all eternity past and all eternity in the future, that moment of time when Jesus hung there on the cross, as Paul says in Galatians 3, he was, he experienced, he took the curse upon him. He took our curse upon him. And um, so he experienced death for everyone, and he experienced death for those who go to a Christless grave because they go there separated from God. And at that moment, he was separated from his own father. That was the last time. As we, um, you heard, as they read the scripture this morning from Luke chapter 24, is where I want to look at. And um, I've been in this chapter before with you and other places as well. It's a chapter I love. But in this chapter, we have a question that's being asked in verse 32. It's actually a statement, but it's also a question they're asking each other in the context of telling each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? So they're, um, they're making a statement to each other, but it's also in the form of a question. There's a question mark after they make the statement or ask the question, didn't our hearts burn within us? In other words, what we gather from this, I believe, is that after he had walked with them and opened the scriptures, something really wonderful happened down in here. <laughs> um, the heart's burning, a burning sensation, a warm feeling a sense of awe came over them as to what they experienced on that walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And so um, they had this incredible experience, and we want to look, look at that here this morning. Uh, backing up some from verse 32 and looking at verse um, 17, Jesus comes alongside of them as they're on the way. And I imagine this was right in the beginning of their travels because they had only about seven miles to go and he had a lot to talk about, as we see down in verse 27. But he had a lot to tell them. And I imagine they had not much more than got started on their walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They say about seven miles. Well, it's, it's in the NIV too, about seven miles back in verse 13. So as he comes alongside of them and walks with them, he has another question for them, and that question is, and he wouldn't have had to ask this because he knows everybody, he knows what we're thinking, but he asked them in verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And I believe he asked that question simply to draw out of them. He wanted them to talk to him, okay? And he wanted to have dialogue conversation with them and so he asked that question to get them talking to him all right and then um, the last part of verse 17 17b as I call it they stood still after he asked that question that stopped them in their tracks their faces were downcast it means they were discouraged they were disappointed, uh, they were forlorn, whatever word you want to use to describe. They were not in a good mood. They were sad. And the reason they were, if you look down to verses 20 and 21, as they are starting to tell him what they're talking about, and they get down here to verse 20 and 21, it said, the chief priests and our rulers have handed over him over, Jesus, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it's the third day since all this took place. They had hoped, they said, he is the one to redeem Israel. 
We know. <laughs> and looking back, it's always much easier as we say we have 2020 vision when we look back. We know that he did redeem Israel, did he not? Simeon and Anna in the temple, they already praised God for the one they were holding even before he died on the cross and redeemed us from our sin. But interestingly, I, you know, I've given thought to this again as I was meditating on this scripture for this morning's purpose here. I find it interesting that basically, perhaps the only one at least that we're reading about as we, as we see pictures of the cross and read the story in the Gospels and the four Gospels about his crucifixion, it seems like there's only one person, at least that's recorded, who knew that when Jesus died or was dying, he was redeeming Israel or he was redeeming us from our sins. Um, the uh, centurion looked up at the cross, saw Jesus, and after all these things were happening, the, the earthquake and the darkness and, and the supernatural events around the time that he was hanging there on the cross, Matthew records that the centurion looked up and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Luke records it more to that and says, the centurion also said, truly, this was a righteous man, okay? But I doubt, I doubt if the centurion, a Roman, uh, not a Jew, a Roman centurion, really knew at that point that redemption was happening, that salvation for sins was happening on the cross. But interestingly, there's that bad man, there's that man hanging next to Jesus on the cross who was there because he had done something really bad to be crucified. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst. So he's one of the worst of criminals hanging next to him. And it seemed like he's about the only one that knows what is happening in that moment. That Jesus, in fact, is redeeming Israel, is redeeming us from our sin. Because, as you know, he looked over to Jesus on the cross and said, and asked a question. Well, he made a statement. He was asking Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you know what Jesus said, you'll be with me today in paradise. So, uh, these two disciples that were walking along the road and Jesus walking with them were telling them that they are discouraged because they thought he was going to redeem Israel, but now they crucified him instead. And we as students of the Bible, we know, don't we, why, why they were saying this. We know that they had their focus in the wrong place. Um, they knew things like, for example, Peter one time said to Jesus, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. Now tell us <laughs> what's in it for us. What will we get out of this? And Jesus uh, didn't rebuke them for that question. Instead, he said, well, he said, at the renewal of all things, in other words, at the time when I set up my kingdom, each of you are going to sit, each one on a throne, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They had political aspirations, and they had ambitions, and they were anticipating that this was coming very near in the future, where they believed that he was the Messiah. But then when he was put to death on the cross and buried in a tomb, they had serious questions as to whether this would ever be fulfilled. Well, um, let's move along here to uh, back again to my, my theme and verse 32 where Jesus had walked with them the whole distance and uh, looked like he was going to keep on going as they read on the scripture. And they said, well, you know, it's getting late in the day. Why don't you stop by and stay in the house with us and he consented and came into the house. And as he's there breaking bread with these two men, their eyes were then finally opened and they recognized him. 
and boom, he's gone. He vanishes from their sight. And then they say, wow, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us as on the road and opened the scriptures to us? It's interesting that they didn't, after he vanished, they did not at that point start comparing notes about what he said. They started comparing their hearts by the way they felt. <laughs> they, they, I'm, down the road, I'm sure they thought a lot because um, he said a lot to them. But initially here, they're talking about their hearts, their feelings, this, this wonderful thing that happened within them as he opened up the scriptures to them. So um, I want to ask you a question here. What is praying? When we pray, what are, what are we doing? Uh, that's a very simple question. Um, doesn't take a seminary graduate to answer that question. When we're praying, we're talking to God, right? When we're praying, we're uh, in fellowship with God, or we might say we're in communion with God. We might say when we pray, we, we in a sense, God's always with us, but in a sense, we take ourselves into the presence of God when we pray. I just thought about this with Jesus being here. These brief three years or so that he was in his ministry, very short time compared to life on planet Earth or eternity, very short time. But wouldn't it be true that all of those, and especially the disciples who spent all this time with them, that as they spend time with them and talk to them, they were doing the same thing that we do now when we talk to God. In a sense, the, all their conversation with Jesus was praying because they were conversing with God. They were fellowshipping with God. They were communing with God. Jesus is God, right? So there's a sense here that every time they talked back and forth to with Jesus being God, they were in a sense praying to God because that's what we do when we talk to God. And so um, just thinking about that here for a moment in verses 19 through 24, I find it interesting as he asked them, what things um, are you talking about? What things are you thinking about that happened in these days? And from 19 to 24, they talk nonstop to him as he wanted them to. And the whole time that they're talking to him, now think about prayer, we talk to God in prayer. While they are talking to him, their hearts are not burning within them. There is no wonderful feeling happening in their heart while they are talking to Jesus, okay? Now, one of the reasons that that is happening is because they don't know who they're talking to. Remember, they have, this has been kept from them. They do not know who this man is walking with them. They didn't know who he was until he broke the bread and disappeared. Paul said something like this, in that when he was visiting in Athens, Rome, in Acts chapter 17, he said, I perceive, he said to the people of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious. In fact, he said, I just saw a sign back there that has to the unknown God. <laughs> and, and Paul was rebuking them for trying to pray to an unknown God. What could be more meaningless than praying to somebody you don't know? Correct? Somebody you have no idea if he even exists out there. And so as these two were walking along the road, they were talking to God, but he was unknown to them. And as a result, their heart was not burning within them at that particular time. And another thing, from verses 19 through 24, it was a one-way conversation. So question, when we pray, when we commune with God, is it only a one-way conversation? 
You know, it, it takes time, doesn't it, to hear back for God to speak to us. It takes, it takes time. And sometimes we may have so much to say, so many requests to make, <laughs> that maybe we don't give him time to respond to us. And making that spiritual connection is not easy. We're in the flesh. Um, we're so aware of all the tangible things around us and that the unseen takes energy, takes effort, concentration, deliberate focus on, the, on God to allow the Spirit of God to speak into us. So why, why did their hearts burn within them? Why did this wonderful thing happen that happened to them? It is because, and you will notice when you get down to verse 27 now, verse 27, after they stopped talking and he started talking, he um, says, it says this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. From that point on, things began to happen within them. Why? Because now God was speaking to them. Now they stopped talking, in a sense, and talking to God, of course, God wants us to do that. That's not wrong, but there has to be a response back from him. And when he started opening the scriptures to them, this is when things started to happen down inside here, okay? And if you'll notice, it says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets. I did my math, and if you count Moses being the first prophet, and he wrote the first five books, and then you go through and begin with Isaiah, uh, you will find that there are 18 prophets that have Bible name, uh, books of the Bible named after them. From Moses to Malachi, there's 18 of our books that are books written by prophets. Not to mention all the prophets that are mentioned that don't have a book named after them, okay? As you read, like the prophet Nathan that spoke with David and these different prophets. Um, it says all the prophets, he explained to them what it said in the scriptures about himself. So again, back to our question, why did their hearts burn within them? One of my favorite prophets, because it's called the Messianic prophet, is the prophet Isaiah. And just imagine now, as they're walking down this road, on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus begins to, they're, they're done talking, and he starts talking to them, and he opens up the scripture to them. And as he keeps going through, he would have started with Moses, as it says, and I don't know how many in between there, but eventually, certainly, eventually, he would have got to Isaiah. What do you think, what would you expect to happen in their hearts as he got to, for example, Isaiah 7:14, where it says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Don't you think that these two disciples were very familiar with who his mother was? I know around Christmas time I love to talk about this and wonder and speculate a little bit about who all did Mary ever tell about how Jesus was conceived and how he was born, right? This, this, <laughs> this amazing birth, uh, this, this um, incarnation, uh, spirit becoming flesh, it only happened one time, it happened to Mary. They were part of the inner circle. They would have known Mary. Don't you think that she would, somewhere along the way, would have explained to them this unusual thing that happened to her? And as they're walking along, they find out that sure enough, this was prophesied in their scriptures. If they didn't know it before, they heard it then. We don't know how well versed they were in scripture. They didn't have Bibles like we had. They had to go to the synagogue and, and listen to the rabbi speak. 
Or when you get through, for example, Isaiah 52, where you have this description of this, this awful description where it talks about the Messiah himself, where it says that there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man. His form was marred beyond human likeness. Remember, it was just three days ago. This walk on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem happened on the first day of the week, the same day that Jesus was resurrected. In other words, his first day back to life on the earth, resurrection, he took this walk with these two disciples. And so it's only three days ago how fresh this would be in their minds about what they just witnessed the horror of Jesus beaten beyond human recognition, hanging there on the cross. That had to be so fresh in their minds. And sure enough, Jesus going through the scriptures, the prophet Isaiah, he reads the very words that described him just three days ago. <laughs> or you get to chapter 53, the one that we're really familiar with. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Uh, verse, that was verse three, verse, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Verse seven, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. They had to remember all of this. This was so real in their life and experience. And now he is opening this scripture to, can you appreciate what would have been happening in your heart if you'd have been one of the two walking down that road and all these scriptures were coming to light about what happened just three days ago, right? <laughs> he was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Their hearts burned within them. What makes your heart burn within you? What is a passion of yours? When you, when you pick up the scripture, uh, we say we believe all the Bible, we love all the Bible, but is there portions? I just mentioned Luke 24 and this on the road to Emmaus. I, I'm not sure why it has such a passion with me. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great story. I just know that my mom and dad used to have years ago a picture on the wall of the two walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus and Jesus with them. And he's, his fingers are like this. He's pointing up as he's explaining the scriptures to them. And that somehow really got etched in my mind and in my heart and, and just stays there. But what is what is what burns in your heart? What is your is it is it when you read the prophets? Maybe the Psalms. I'm reading through the Psalms right now and through the Bible reading. Um, is it the Gospels? Different portions of the Gospel, like Luke 24 or Book of Acts, how the church began and and how God used those courageous disciples who were wimps just before that. <laughs> Or, of course, the letters, you know, Paul and James and Jude and Peter and Hebrews and all the, the letters that follow that. Or Revelation. Today, there's a lot of study in Revelation because of the times we're living in. But what is it that makes your heart burn? The results, the results of a burning heart, the results of when something wonderful happens down in here, is found in verses 33 to 35. Look what it says after he disappears and he had opened, after he had opened the scripture to them and, and they say it in our hearts burn within us. Verse 33, 34, and 35, what happened? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. That was the 11 saying that. It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then these two who were walking with him, 
Then they said what happened to them. The two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread and their eyes were open. So uh, what happened, the results of this heart burning within them, they had to tell someone. They absolutely, there was no way that they could keep this to themselves. The first thing they did was got up and seven miles back to Jerusalem, right? It says it was about seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now they turn right around and head back to where they came from to Jerusalem to, because they just had to tell what had happened to them. Uh, later on, Peter and John, as you know, like in Acts chapter 4, they're, they're there in Jerusalem witnessing to the name of Jesus. And they're told not to speak anymore in this name. And you know what their reply was? Peter and John both replied, We cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. How does that affect us? What's that saying to us? You know, you can't help but speak the things we have seen and heard. I, I guess I didn't, I didn't mention to you that I, you know, for me, uh, what burns in my heart, my passion, I tell people I have, I have two passions, two strong passions. Um, one is just being in defense of the gospel. Uh, I've seen, we see the departing of the gospel, you know, uh, Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Because, he said to Timothy, the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears who want to hear what they want to hear, and teachers will say what they want to hear. Okay, And we are seeing this incredible departure from the truth. Just this past Sunday, I was teaching a Sunday school class, and we were in the book of Job, the first chapter. And it says, the first verse, there was a man named Job. And the material that they were using in this particular class, uh, material to, you know, bring light in on the, on, the sub, on the subject, said, there never was a man named Job, Right? Uh, it, this, is, this man did not literally live. This is just a story to teach us some lessons about suffering, right? That is bad. That is very bad. I hope if you ever see material like that, you reject that because it says plainly there was a man named Job. And we have no reason to believe there was. Anyway, one of my passions is defending the gospel. The other is, and you've probably heard me say this before, the return of our Lord, because I believe that is coming up really, really soon. And I can get excited about that. In fact, I could probably preach every Sunday on that topic. Um, but of course, we're told in Acts to preach the whole counsel of God, right? There's so much to preach. Can't just preach on one thing, but... My passion is so strong when I look around and hear the news and see what the prophets have said about his return. Um, it's our blessed hope, and we're looking for that, and I believe it's coming close. So again, um, I've got to wind things down here. What, what is your passion? What is it that burns in your heart? I ask that question because I believe that as you read the scripture, as you think about God and think about spiritual things, if there is, there should be, whatever it is that's burning in your heart, could it be that it's that that God is asking you to share with someone else? That which, Peter, like Peter said, we can't help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. If there's something, and I hope there is, that's pressing in your heart that you just gives you that excitement, that feeling. Like the two disciples, they turned right around and went back to Jerusalem. They had to tell somebody. I love the little story of Gordon Maxwell, who was a missionary to India, and uh, he had to learn the language. And uh, he... Um, ask a Hindu scholar to sit down with him and, and teach, him, teach him 
the language, okay? And this Hindu scholar refused to do it. And after questioning him and pleading with him, he said, why won't you teach me the language? Uh, he said, because you want to make me a Christian. That's why I won't do it. And Gordon said, you know, forget all that. Let's let, just, just teach me the language. In a sense, I'll, I'll let you alone. Just teach me the language, right? And then he come back and said, look, nobody can spend that much time with you without becoming a Christian. <laughs> I have to think about myself. Uh, do I rub off on others that much? That if they dare to spend any amount of time with me, there's a real possibility they'll become a Christian. Well, God bless Gordon Maxwell. That, that was, uh, you know, and th think about that for ourselves. Is that, is God using us in that way? Your heart must be burning somewhere with passion for God's word. You're here every Sunday. Some of you, I recognize you. And that is good. You're here because you want to hear, you want to praise, praise God. But think about it. Maybe, just maybe, that which is a passion for you. If you haven't already, if you have, God bless you. If you haven't already, maybe that is what God wants you to go and tell someone else. Father, we thank you for burning hearts. We thank you for passions you put within us. We know they're of the Spirit. Uh, we could not conjure that up ourselves. We are natural. We are humans. We are physical. It's the Spirit that makes our contact with you and you with us. It's the Spirit, as Jesus said, that draws us to our Father. Thank you, Lord, for this morning, for those who have come, who have been drawn here. Bless them and use them in this community. And may your name go out and may they, you be glorified. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.